צהריים טובים, תודה לכולכם שבאתם. ברוכים הבאים להרצאה מאת חתן פרס דן דוד, מר תום הגויאן. לאחר ההרצאה שלו יש שלב בו הקהל יוכל לפנות בשאלות למר הגויאן. יש פה שני מיקרופונים, אחד בכל צד. מי שקרוב למעברים יוכל פשוט לגשת בצורה שקטה למיקרופון ולפנות בשאלות. יש לנו גם שני סדרנים פה שמוזמנים להרים ידיים, פה איפשהו, מסתובבים. אז הם יוכלו להעביר את המיקרופון לאנשים לפי הצבעה שנמצאים יותר עמוק בתוך השורות. רק בקשה אחת אחרונה לפני שאנחנו מתחילים, כדי לכבד את המעמד ואת האורח שלנו, בבקשה להשתיק פלאפונים. כל מי שלא עשה את זה עד עכשיו, זו הזדמנות מצוינת. אז אני מתכבדת להזמין את הדיקנית, פרופסור חנה נווה, לעלות ולברך את חתן פרס דן דוד. תודה רבה לדנה, אני אעבור ברשותכם לאנגלית, לכבוד האורח שלנו. Um, it is a great honor and pleasure to have with us this morning Mr. Atom Egoyan, uh, who has just last night received uh, the Dan David Prize uh, in the category of representation of the past uh, and more specifically artistic rendition and representation of the past Uh, for his work in film. Uh, the Dan David Prize is a prize that Tel Aviv University was honored with by Mr. Dan David, who also established the foundation of Dan David. Uh, annually, this uh, prize is awarded to very, very distinguished uh, people who have done distinguished, outstanding, superb work in those categories which were chosen annually every uh, year they choose the categories for that year, establish an international, very uh, prestigious board of uh, uh, a committee and a board of uh, judges, so to speak, uh, committee members who decide upon the recipients of the prize. And it was my special honor to serve in that board, in that committee, and to be able to put my vote in there and put my mouth, my big mouth in there, uh, for Mr. Atom Egoyan. <laughs> So this is my opportunity also to thank Mr. Dan David and Mr. Gabriela David, who give Tel Aviv University the honor of giving out this prize. And um, usually we ask the recipient to, as we call it, give back to the community. And in this case, there are two forms of giving back, and I want you to know about them. The two forms are these. One is what we are doing right now and what Mr. Egoyan has been doing the last two days with the students of the Film and Television Department. Hello to the students of Tel Aviv <laughs> University. <laughs> Film and Television Department, I must tell you that Mr. Egoyan has remarked to me that your work is outstanding, unusually outstanding. Am I correct? Yes, you can say it yourself later if you feel like. But actually, the giving back in this form, back to us, back to our students, back to the next generation, back to the next generators of film into the industry, into the art, into the art world, the art scene, and into the social scene where film is so, uh, uh, such a great operator now more than ever. Uh, uh, so we are very, very honored that he worked with our students and gave so many hours and so much attention and care to our students. I'm sure they are very, very gratified, and we need him to come back until he sees each and every one of our students present and future. Of course, that's a full-time job. You may consider that. It's for no pay at all. Um, the second form of giving, which is a really wonderful thing that was uh, established by, with the establishment of the Dan David Prize, is that every one of the recipients is um, required, may I say, but of course accepts the requirement, uh, to give back in the form of uh, scholarships for doctorate students and postdoctoral students in that field. And therefore, Mr. Egoyan, together with the other recipients of the prize, this afternoon at five o'clock, we'll have another ceremony to attend where they are not the receiving side, but they are the giving side. And they will be giving scholarships, very nice scholarships, from their award money, 
from their pocket, so to speak. So again, we are very, very grateful. Thank you, Mr. Egoya. I take, I take this opportunity to thank all the members of the film and television department who have participated in this very uh, intensive work of arranging these days, this event as well, and uh, doing whatever has to be done to make uh, Mr. Egoyan's very short visit a happy one so that he will want to come again. So I thank the head of the department, Dr. Dubi Rubinstein, and uh, Mr. Ruven Hacker, the head of the production track, Amir Tausinger, and Dana, Dana, not international, totally local, <laughs> for her uh, very, very intensive help. And I also am happy to greet Marcy Gerstein, um, Mr. Egoyan's assistant, who is here with us, and uh, uh, who has helped us uh, arrange all this. I will now invite Professor Aviad Kleinberg from Tel Aviv University History Department and the head of the Tel Aviv University Press to make a few opening remarks concerning this event. He will then proceed to invite Mr. Nachman Ingbar, who will make his opening remarks. Then we shall have Mr. Egoyan give us his presentation and show us what he would like to show us. And then we will have the question and answer period conducted by Mr. Ingbar together with Atom Egoyan. So be very patient and it will be very much worth your while and thank you for coming. Professor Kleinberg, please. In the good old days when there were rules for everything, there were rules for greeting. Benedict, Pope, servant of the servants of Christ, peace and apostolic benediction. You start with your credentials. Who are you? What gives you the right to bless or curse? And you continue with formulas. The mighty are wise and magnanimous, the weak, hardworking and faithful, the religious, saintly and pious, poets, eloquent, women, beautiful. You were allowed a certain degree of originality, not too much. Better stick to the formulas. What they lack in freshness, they gain in safety. And besides, if these slightly worn out praises were good for our fathers, surely they are good for us. It is all different nowadays. We are no longer satisfied with what was good enough for our fathers and mothers. Uh, there are no more rules, and we, have to, and we have supposedly lost our taste for formulas, down with conformism and cliches, long live originality. Somehow, though, heaven knows how, with all our efforts to be unique, we all sound exactly the same. Well, not all of us, actually. Atom Egoyan, for example, does not. Great artists have their own voice. I remember what was flashing through my mind as I was watching Exotica, the first Egoyan film I saw, a realization that I am listening to a unique voice. There was something else, a strong sense of pleasure mixed with the profound sadness of the story. St. Augustine describes the feeling in his confessions, art can create a moral conflict between aesthetic pleasure and human empathy, between poetry and history. We take pleasure in the protagonist's pain, as the young Augustine took pleasure in Dido's despair. In his later years, Augustine was ashamed of his aesthetic delights. It is shameful to delight in other people's sorrow, and it is wrong to let untruths have such an effect on our souls. God's word in the Bible is deliberately delivered in Sermo Humilis, humble style, to indicate that substance is more important than form. But great artists can bring dignity to our aesthetic pleasures, nor are those pleasures as vain and shallow as Augustine implies. Great art makes us think and refill our cliches. It forces us to break loose of our formulas. Great art liberates. Ato Megoyan is a great artist. But can artists make poetic word out of the flesh of history? The two, says Aristotle in his poetics, are diametrically opposed. Poetry tells us how things could have or should have been. History is what Alcibiades did and what others did to Alcibiades. That is all. History, in other words, is about the concrete and the specific, art about potentialities and universals. Historians try to reproduce the non-poetic elements of our lives, recount facts, say what people actually did and said, rather than what they could or should have done or said. This is why history is often boring or annoying. Life is not great literature. In his film Ararat, Egoyan tries to turn one particular piece of history, the actions and words of the perpetrators and victims of the Armenian genocide, the actions and words of the ongoing attempt to deny its very existence into art. The protagonist 
involved in making a film about the Armenian genocide grapple with questions of history, memory, and moral responsibility? What are the limits of poetic license? Does the aesthetic and pedagogic impetus justify a rewriting of the facts for the sake of a higher than factual truth? The answer Goyan provides is, as always, complex. Whatever you choose, there is a price to pay. The main character of our art, Rafi, returns to Turkish Armenia to bring back authentic images, history. The unadorned, undirected reality Real relics of history, he seems to think, will balance the artistic license of the film creator. At the Canadian border, he is interrogated by a customs official. He retells his own story and the story of the Armenian genocide. Is this finally the truth? Not quite. The customs man has doubts. He calls the protagonist's mother to authenticate the story. Switching to Armenian, the language of the witness, she asks, do you want me to lie? Yes, he answers. Why do these seekers of truth have to lie? Because Rafi has brought back from Armenia both authentic images, truth, and heroin, opium for the masses, the ultimate untruth. Every retelling, even the most sincere, erases the rough voices of the witnesses. Just as memory replaces what Alcibiades did and what others did to Alcibiades with what our mind, subjective, unstable, self-centered, has done with them. And yet, even when it obeys willy-nilly the rules of artistic fashion and the commandments of profit-seeking, great art exposes lies, even its own, and tells what history in its pursuit of actuality often silences. It translates pain and remorse, cruelty and compassion, guilt and innocence into images. Great art records what historians too often leave out. Ato Megoyan is a great artist. It is a pleasure to have him with us. I'd like now to invite Mr. Nahum Ingber to the podium. In my turn, I would like to welcome Mr. Atom Egoyan, the famous Canadian film director born in Egypt of Armenian parents. Um, and would like to con congratulate him on the prestigious award he received here last night in Tel Aviv University. This is not Atom Egoyan's first visit to Israel. Far from that. He visited us two years ago in Jerusalem Film Festival, and I still remember him, always accompanied by his actress wife, Arsine Hanjian, both of them very much younger than today, though Atom Egoyan is forever young, um, showing audiences in the Jerusalem Film Festivals in the later 80s and the early 90s, their current films, much before they were shown in Israeli cinema for the general public. Uh, Aviad spoke about the first uh, film of Egoyan he saw because it, it was the first film Atom Egoyan uh, showed in Israeli's cinema. But before that, all his, most of his earlier uh, films were shown in the Jerusalem Film Festivals. I remember his early films, part of the revolution of world cinema, always so unique, so personal, so intriguing and so innovative in the cinematic language, using, always using new media like video as part of the cinema language. And also the fact that he comes from a country based on immigration, Canada, and in himself an Armenian born in Egypt, an example of multicultural influences so reminiscent of the Israeli situation. So I am honored to invite Atom Egoyan to give a lecture here in Tel Aviv University. And please welcome our distinguished, distinguished guest, Atom Egoyan.
Thank you. Th th those were extraordinary opening words. Uh, it's always very uh, emotional to visit Israel, and it's particularly this time because this is my first time uh, actually here at the university, and it's been it has been astonishing. The quality of the work I've seen has been amazing, but just the spirit in the hallways and, and seeing this crowd of uh, incredible, there's an incredible energy here and it's unique and uh, I'm honored to be a part of it. Ten years ago, I was nominated for two Academy Awards for writing and directing The Suite Hereafter. In the weeks leading up to the Oscars, I was flown back and forth to New York and Los Angeles, where I was presented at various film industry functions, interviewed on national television, and ostensibly displayed at any social event where I might be seen. Visibility is an essential ingredient of fame. In my field, being nominated for an Academy Award is the height of fame. I didn't win either of the awards that night. Titanic, true to its title, swept through a ceremony that culminated in an uneasy moment when its director, James Cameron, stood in front of the global audience and asked for a few moments of silence in observation of the lives that had been lost on that ill-fated ship. I'll never forget the disturbing sense of power that Cameron exercised with that gesture. A few days before, all the nominees had been rigorously coached to keep their acceptance speeches as short as possible. Yet here is this man, the self-proclaimed king of the world, consuming one of the most valuable commodities in that world, airtime during the internationally broadcast Academy Awards to honor the dead. I couldn't help but feel that he was also honoring something else. James Cameron was demonstrating his power to make that statement. As we in the audience sat dutifully in silence to pay tribute to those lost souls that perished on the Titanic, I noticed several Hollywood producers glancing at each other incredulously. Years before, when he won his award for Schindler's List, Steven Spielberg hadn't gone quite that far. And here we all were, heads bowed in silence to commemorate a group of people we could now only associate with a special effects spectacle rather than with a specific historic event. Or had the movie become the historic event? Had the Titanic somehow bulldozed its way into our collective psyche in such a manner that it became, in effect, a living experience of what it meant to be there? Is this what history has become in our culture? A set of indicators that simulate the experience of what things must have meant. Later that night, I witnessed the elite of Hollywood at a number of social events where everyone was talking about one thing and one thing only, Cameron's gesture. Can you believe what he did, people remarked, that he'd have the guts. By the end of the evening, there was no doubt in my mind as to what had been consecrated in that outrageously long vow of silence Cameron had imposed on Hollywood and the rest of the world. What had made the gesture so unsettling? In those precious moments of prime time silence, Cameron demonstrated with staggering effect the privilege of commemorative exclusivity. He had staked his claim on the public imagination in order to impose on the audience the concept that they should remember what he wanted them to remember. His position had allowed him to set an agenda and any reference he might have made to any other victims of tragedy an appeal, say, to all those who had lost their lives on the sea would only dilute the impact of his claim. There was no room for inclusiveness. There was, after all, a product to pitch, Titanic. And in Cameron's view, perhaps, anything to extend the power of this brand was acceptable. And this, of course, is the brutal reality of any cause. No matter what its moral significance, it's right to be remembered. It is at the mercy of those individuals who choose to attach themselves to its needs. From charities to historical calamities to plagues to famines, we are in need of spokespeople who can attach a public face to an issue. In a world of victims, only the most ostentatious will be noticed. 
In victim culture, this constitutes survival of the fittest. I always wanted to make a film about the Armenian Genocide of 1915. I came to Canada at the age of two from Egypt, where both my parents were born. My father's mother, whom I never met, was an orphan of this terrible event. And my grandfather, whom I also never knew, narrowly escaped the wholesale slaughter of my race in the provinces of eastern Turkey. When we arrived in Canada in 1962, my parents made the curious decision to move the family to Victoria, British Columbia. Here, in the westernmost part of the country, I was raised without the three pillars of Armenian identity. There was no community, no Armenian church, and though Armenian was my mother tongue, I refused to speak it at home, and it too was soon lost. Without the community, church, or language, my path towards complete cultural assimilation was virtually assured. I arrived in Toronto in the fall of 1978. Convinced that I would make an excellent diplomat, I enrolled myself in the study of international relations. At this point, my path to an exotic foreign posting was interrupted by two factors. First was a developing interest in cinema, and even though I didn't formally study film, I became involved with the campus newspaper where I began to write reviews. My second unexpected encounter was with the Armenian Student Association, where I began to get a sense of the political history that had had such a huge effect on my ancestors. During these initial months in Toronto, my life became a blur as I tried to juggle these activities, my regular academic courses, my reintroduction into Armenian culture, and my growing fascination with film, until one evening all these pursuits became focused on one event. The Alan Parker movie, Midnight Express, had been gathering an increasing amount of controversy since its premiere at the Toronto Film Festival some months before. The story concerned a young man, Billy Hayes, who gets caught smuggling drugs in Turkey. The film shows his horrific journey through the living hell of a Turkish prison where the inmates are subject to the most inhumane and brutal treatment imaginable. Over the years, the film has come to represent, from the Turkish point of view, the supreme example of anti-Turkish propaganda. Indeed, when rumors about the production of Ararat first began to circulate amongst the Turkish media, the initial fear was that my film would be the new Midnight Express. I'd like to read a passage from an article I wrote for my campus paper 30 years ago. Quote, Upon arriving at the theater last Friday night, the audience was confronted by a group of agitated young men distributing pamphlets to the crowd pamphlets boldly professing to expose the other side of Midnight Express. The document charges that Midnight Express is a cheap and racist film aimed at making fast millions by twisting facts and condemning other nations. I then wrote, Midnight Express does have the potential to create in the mind of its audience that Turks are all sadistic monsters, and because of this biased view, the film will never enter the ranks of great cinema. The image is simply not true. What must be questioned, however, is a government which gathered its population together in 1915 to incite hatred against its Armenian citizens and a government which is now trying to suppress the release of this major motion picture. That was about Midnight Express 30 years ago. On that evening, I suddenly realized the power of cinema to make people believe that what they were seeing was absolutely real. A film has the ability to enter the viewer's mind with stunning immediacy. And for this reason, it is both a hugely exciting artistic form and an ideal instrument for propaganda. Sometimes the line between the two is very thin. There is no doubt that a film like Midnight Express perpetrated negative and highly damaging images of Turks. On the other hand, the film was supposedly based on facts. Was it as simple as Mark Twain's advice that you had to first get your facts, then do with them as you will? And why were the screenwriter, Oliver Stone, and the director, Alan Parker, representing the Turkish characters in the extreme way they were shown? Was it to serve the needs of the story? What were the needs of the story? In 1997, the Canadian writer, Guy van der Haag, wrote the Governor, Governor, wrote the Governor General's, sorry, won the Governor General's Award for The Englishman's Boy a novel based on the 1873 massacre of the Assiniboine Indians, 
coupled with an entirely invented story of a Hollywood producer who uses the incident to make a proto-fascistic movie, what van der Heeg refers to as a hymn to manifest destiny. During his speech at York University in Toronto, van der Heeg, who once had aspirations to become an academic historian, said that writing his book was far more difficult than he had anticipated. Remnants of his historical training left him wary of the impulse of the novelist, and the novelist was equally leery of the historian. One moment he found himself agreeing with historians who regard faction or factory as the work of magpies who pick all the shiny, entertaining bits from the past, tart them up even more, and try to pass off their gaudy stews as the real goods. And the next minute, he would find himself siding with writers of fiction, asking himself, how can historians take promising material, suck the blood from it, and then proudly exhibit the corpses to the only people who could possibly be interested in poking them for signs of life, other professional historians? In writing The Englishman's Boy, van der Heeg was continually asking his divided self what he was up to, or should be up to. At the root of his confusion was indecision about which hat to wear. He found his solution in a tactic which, according to him, historical novelists have traditionally deployed to skirt the problems of authority and accuracy. That is, to focus on a little explored incident whose principal players were largely unknown. In van der Heeg's own words, quote, the public's unfamiliarity with the Cypress Hills massacre the contradictory accounts of what actually occurred there, as well as my own conviction that the destiny of Canada was influenced by a, an obscure border affray acted out on the periphery of the two empires supplied me with plenty of room to maneuver as a novelist. In making a film about the Armenian Genocide of 1915, I was faced with two additional burdens. While people may not have known about the details of the Cypress Hills Massacre of 1873, what van der Heeg was referring to. There was a template in the reader's minds of what archetype to set the story against. This was, after all, a story, his film, or his book, about cowboys and Indians. The basic terrain of the story already existed in the popular consciousness. On the other hand, it's difficult to reference a popular movie that conjures up images of Eastern Anatolia in the late days of the Ottoman Empire. The second and infinitely more monumental issue I had to contend with was the denial of this historical event. Without going into details, it's important to note that after the collapse of the Young Turk government in 1918, the new Turkish government arrested several hundred former party leaders who were suspected of direct roles in the mass deportations and massacres. While many of these criminals fled their country for Germany, their wartime ally, which then granted them asylum, Many were left behind who had collaborated in the genocide, including Turkish state and local administrators, party activists, policemen, and a variety of specialists in mass violence, businessmen and farmers who had seized Armenian property. Cases were prepared against these criminals for murder, treason, theft, and similar offenses under Turkish law. What happened next is one of the most staggeringly cynical acts of the last century. While the new Turkish authorities carried out a series of trials during 1919 and 1920, placing on the public record an important collection of confessions by former Young Turk leaders, as well as secret state and party papers concerning the tactics of deportation and mass murder, these trials were strongly opposed by the rising nationalist movement led by Mustafa Kemal. Kemal, later known as Ataturk, was convinced that these trials were a symbol of foreign efforts to dismember Turkey. In his book, The Splendid Blonde Beast, Money, Law, and Genocide in the 20th Century, Christopher Simpson provides a detailed account of what transpired. After the First World War, Britain, France, and the United States began to negotiate with each other in secret as to how best to divide up the vast oil and mineral wealth of Turkey's Ottoman Empire. Kamal, according to Simpson, skillfully played these three powers against each other and insisted on amnesty for the young Turks as part of the price of, for their support in the division of the defunct empire. Simpson writes that, though overlooked today, the Ottoman holdings were of an extraordinary value, perhaps the richest imperial treasure since the European seizure of the New World four centuries earlier. The empire had been eroding for decades, 
but by the time of the Turkish defeat in World War I, it still included most of what is today Turkey, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, and the oil sheikdoms of the Persian Gulf. The Euro European governments sensed that the time had come to seize this rich prize. Thus, even though the three allies had pushed for tough punishment for the young Turk criminals, including the establishment of an independent Armenian Republic in northeastern Turkey, they could not decide amongst themselves how best to divide the rich oil fields of the former empire. Ataturk, who by the end of 1920 had established a rival government in Ankara, took advantage of this indecision not only to put pressure on the shaky Turkish government of Istanbul to shut down the criminal, criminal trials of the young Turks, but also to abrogate the Treaty of Sev, the allied document that granted the Armenians a homeland. In return, he promised the allies complete cooperation in gaining access to the valuable oil fields. Written in 1923 and now preserved in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., a revealing internal document by Alan Dulles of the U.S. State Department states, and I quote, confidentially, the State Department is in a bind. Our task would be simple if the reports of the atrocities could be declared untrue or even exaggerated, but the evidence, alas, is irrefutable. In the years that followed, a remarkable shift in U.S. government behavior and media content took place as the State Department, motivated by the desire to secure access to the vast untapped resources of the former Ottoman territories, began to turn the U.S. public towards Turkey. While the sufferings of Armenia had been widely acknowledged during the war years, recognition of the genocide began to recede in accordance with State Department plans. In this country, Founded 60 years ago after the most horrifying act of genocide in the last century, Israel's official policy in recognizing the Armenian genocide has been consistently evasive, even though some of the most compelling witnesses to this historic event were prominent Jewish voices. The American ambassador to Turkey at the time of the genocide was Henry Morgenthau Sr., who wrote detailed reports alerting his government to what he then referred to as the darkest chapter in modern history. Some 30 years later, the brilliant lawyer Raphael Lemkin, who lost 40 members of his own family in the Holocaust, made explicit reference to the Armenian massacres when he coined the word genocide. Brilliant scholars in this country, such as Israel Charney and Yehuda Bauer, have written exclusively on the subject, not to mention Yair Oran's excellent books focusing on the complex relationship of Israel and the Armenian genocide. While the moral leadership of these and many other great Jewish minds has been truly exemplary, the contradiction between the real politic of the matter, particularly in relation to Israel's relationship with Turkey, has been frustrating, with the official position verging on outright denial. This brings us to the disturbing fact that when talking about the Turkish denial of the Armenian genocide, we must remind ourselves that Turkey has only been able to sustain this denial because it has been aided and abetted by the West and its allies. While France and Canada have recently acknowledged the genocide, it still runs counter to general Western interests to pursue the matter with Turkey. This denial has been universally sustained and meticulously pursued. While every single serious scholar of Holocaust has substantiated this terrible tragedy, Official Turkish sources, as well as some supposedly objective academics, continue to perpetuate the lie. From the moment I began to write Ararat, the images of those young men handing out pamphlets before the screening of Midnight Express so many years ago came flooding back. I could anticipate that any film that presented the Armenian Genocide would be accused, from the Turkish point of view, of perpetuating stereotypes. Yet from an Armenian perspective, in terms of stories that have been told over and over again, the barbaric and vicious images were very real. In this context, the challenge in telling the story of Ararat was threefold. First of all, I had to find a way of presenting the strongest and most persistent of cultural beliefs with which Armenians had been raised. Secondly, I had to examine and question the drives and sources that determined those beliefs. And finally, I had to show the emotional foundations of those beliefs as they persist in our culture. There are those who may feel that I should have told the story more simply, should have concentrated on the film within the film. 
Arat, from this perspective, should have focused on setting the record straight. But I never saw this as my cinematic responsibility. The events that took place in eastern Tur Turkey in the spring of 1915 are extremely well documented. Not only do we have the studies of Holocaust scholars, numerous eyewitness accounts, hundreds of newspaper reports, we also have the detailed accounts of German consular heads stationed in every Turkish town that saw its Armenian population decimated. While Turkey will dismiss much of the American, English, and French evidence as being part of the wartime propaganda effort, and most recently they've said that the diaries of Henry Morgenthau are a complete fabrication, how can they respond to the thousands of documents in the German state archives? Again, Germany was Turkey's closest ally at the time. What do Turkish historians have to say about the account, for example, of the German consul in Aleppo reporting to Reich Councillor Bellman Hohwig on July 27, 1915? The German consul wrote, and this is a direct quote from the German state archives, the Turkish government has gone much further than the scope of justified defense measures, but instead are consciously aiming to achieve the downfall of the largest possible proportions of the Armenian people by using methods which are borrowed from antiquity, but which are unworthy of a government that wishes to remain in alliance with Turkey, with Germany. It has tried, and of this there can be no doubt, to take advantage of the opportunity to rid itself of the Armenian question. It has sacrificed a magnitude of innocent people the Turkish government has driven its Armenian subjects into the desert in thousands upon thousands, has driven the women to such desperation that they set their babies and newborns by the wayside, has sold their adolescent daughters, with the result that they have thrown themselves, even with their small children, into the river. It has had men illegally shot in lonely places and has the bodies of its victims fed to the dogs and birds of prey. The German consul concludes his account to the Reich Councillor by stating that the Turkish government would, quote, never be able to deny responsibility for what has happened. The events that took place are irrefutable. My film does not seek to add anything to the historical record of what happened, since the real issues for me have been why what happened has been so systematically ignored, and what the effects of that ignorance have been on successive generations. Ararat is not so much about the past as it is about the present. It is about the responsibilities of people living now. A film that sought to depict the horrors of the Armenian genocide would have no doubt been emotional, but it would not have dealt with the issues Armenians must live with today. This is best summarized in Ararat's script in the scene where Rafi, the young man working as a driver on the film within the film, is taking Ali, the Turkish actor playing Jevdit Bey, back home after a day of shooting. And I'd like to show this sort of extended clip from the film film because it sort of concentrates some of the ideas I've been talking about so far. So this is quite a long clip, but I think it's worth watching. And I just press play, I think, right? I hit this. Do I? Oh. Sort of have it in the movie, so it is kind of ridiculous. No, I don't. It's so tight. I can't. What, does it have to be so tight, this thing? I wanted to thank you. Are you kidding? This was a huge break for me. I mean, you're one of my favorite directors. I just, I, I want to thank you. Can, can, I, can I ask you something? Huh? Did you cast me just because I'm half Turkish? No. It's because I thought you would be perfect for the part. But being Turkish didn't hurt. Oh, you didn't hurt, no. You know, you never asked me what I thought of the history. What is there to think? Whether I believed it happened. A genocide. Well, I'm not sure it matters. No, I don't want to take up your time. I just, I just, the thing is, when I, when I, when I play a part, it's supposed to come from here. Right, not not here, right? Because I was I was doing some research, and um, I think the Turks had a real reason to believe that the Armenians were a threat to their security. I mean, uh, uh, their eastern border was 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 threatened by Russia, yeah, and and I mean they believed that the Armenians were going to betray them. 
So this was this was war. Populations get moved around all the time. So and again, was, thank you for your work. Ali, we're ready for you. <laughs> Yes? Why didn't you answer him? Because he's having regrets about playing the part. I can understand. He will receive anger from his people. But he thinks Turkey was at war with Armenia. I'm sorry, Mr. Stroyan, I just I don't think I understand. Young man, do you know what still causes so much pain? It's not the people we lost or the land. It's to know that we could be so hated. Who are these people who could hate us so much? How can they still deny their hatred and so hate us? Hate us even more. Scene. Thanks. It must be really weird to get into that headspace. Yeah. I, I mean, I was raised with all these stories, you know, evil Turks and everything, so I, I'm a little hardened to it all. Yeah. But what you did today, I mean, it, uh, it made me feel all that anger again. Hey, thanks. So I take it you're uh, Armenian. Well, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I meant when I said I was, you know, raised to feel out of hatred to the person you're playing. Right, right. You really pulled it off. Well, it'd be kind of hard to disappoint you. What do you mean? Well, you were kind of prepared to hate my character. Like you said. Well, sure. I, but I'm also kind of suspicious of stuff that's supposed to make me feel anything. You know? So when I was watching today, like, even though I know we were supposed to make me feel like hating you, I, I resisted it, but, uh, but then, I mean, by the end of the scene, I just, I... You feel like killing me. Yeah. My dad was killed trying to assassinate a Turkish diplomat. It was almost 15 years ago. I could never understand what would make him want to murder, what, what he had to imagine that Turkish ambassador represented. But today he gave me a sense of what was going on in his head. I want to thank you. You're welcome. to give it to you. 
And thanks. Now, was this before or after my conversation with him? After. I guess he wants to show there are no hard feelings. Uh, okay. Thanks. Were you serious about what you told him? Oh, you don't think it happened? What, a genocide? Yeah. Are you going to shoot me or something? Look, I never heard about any of this stuff when I was growing up. You know? I did some research for the part. From what I read, there were deportations. And lots of people died. Armenians and Turks. It's World War One. But Turkey wasn't at war with the Armenians. I mean, just like Germany wasn't at war with the Jews. They were citizens. They were expecting to be protected. That scene you just shot was based on an eyewitness account. Your character, Jevdet Bey. The only reason they put him in Van was to carry out the complete elimination of the Armenian population in Van. There were telegrams. There were communiques. I'm not saying that something didn't happen. Something. I was born here. So were you, right? Yeah. This is a new country. So let's just drop the fucking history and get on with it. No one's gonna wreck your home. No one's gonna destroy your family. Let's go inside and uncork this thing and, and celebrate. Do you know what Adolf Hitler told his military commanders to convince them that his plan would work? Who remembers the extermination of the Armenians? And nobody did. Nobody does. On the basis of this scene, we can understand the tremendous complexity of historical transposition. Ali, the actor transformed himself to play a murderous monster. Rafi's father, because of his political convictions, transformed himself into a killer. Is Rafi moved by Ali's performance because of what the actor incarnated or because of the process of incarnation? Can this incarnation become a form of testimony? If we acknowledge that survivors might tend to exaggerate the crime, does that make them unreliable? Can an actor who is only playing a role give the viewer the critical distance needed to understand an event? Can a director? Can a film? Who has the authority, be it moral, spiritual, or artistic, to tell a story? In the 1960s, Elie Wiesel, the survivor, replaced Anne Frank, the victim, as the incarnation of the Holocaust in the United States. In his book, While America Watches, Televising the Holocaust, Jeffrey Chandler suggests that in the 1990s, Steven Spielberg replaced Elie Wiesel, the survivor, as the new incarnation of the Holocaust in popular culture. This shift in popular interest from individuals who experienced the event to those who represented the event is a telling sign of our, uh, of our times. In creating a film that seeks to recount the story of the Armenian Genocide, this becomes even more complicated by the fact that we have no Anne Frank, no Elie Wiesel, and certainly no Spielberg. While many of our most noted figures perished during the genocide, none of them achieved popular recognition outside of our own culture. Armenians haven't had the intense self-scrutiny ignited by a survivor such as Primo Levi. While a few films have been made about the genocide, none of these have received commercial distribution in North America. 
Even though the childhood experiences of Archil Gorky, one of the founders of abstract expressionism and the only famous survivor of the genocide, are not commonly known. For many people, the glimpses of this great painter's life shown in my film have served as an introduction to this important artist. Midway through Ararat, Ani, an art historian specializing in the work of Archil Gorky, visits the film studio reproduction of the city of Van, where the historic screen epic, the film within the film, is set. We gather that this is the place where Gorky had spent his youth, and in an earlier scene, the filmmakers, unaware of this fact until it is revealed to them by Ani in a lecture they have attended, are now eager to incorporate the one famous survivor into the story. While on set, Ani notices that something is wrong, that the representation of Mount Ararat painted on the backdrop is out of place. says to Americans or any foreign consul that there are internal troubles in Van. So inform the American government that American lives are in danger. Everything you see here is based on what my mother told me. What is it? You wouldn't be able to see Mount Ararat from Bonn. Well, yes, but I thought it would be important. But it's not true. <laughs> it's true in the spirit. Well, see what you can do, okay? And, and let me know. Uh, okay, I, I gotta go. Um, yeah, I gotta get off. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Sorry, I had a call. Ruben, Annie's confused about the mountain, Ararat. She has noticed quite correctly that it would not be seen from Vaughn. Well, well, we thought we could stretch things a bit. I mean, it's such an identifiable symbol, and given the moment in history that we're trying to show... So I it's just... something you could justify? Sure, poetic license. Where do you get those? Wherever you can. So that's my job? To let you feel better about distorting things? The young boy in our film gets sent by Osher to deliver a letter. He gets caught by the Turks. That's the character we'd make into Gorky. How would you do that? Okay. By April 1915, the Turks have completely surrounded the Armenian quarter. Within the quarter, inside these fortified walls, the American mission, run by a doctor, Clarence Usher. Okay. Outside, a few hundred men armed with ancient guns are surrounded by, by well-armed troops with the latest in European artillery. Miraculously, through their ingenuity or, or their teamwork, they're able to hold the enemy in position, but they're completely isolated. They're cut off from the outside world. Usher has to somehow get word to the outside world about what's about to happen. And so he hopes that one of these boys, Gorky, will get through. This 
So as you can see, the actors playing Jebdet Bey and the American missionary Clarence Usher are acting their parts in a style that sort of borders on historical kitsch. From a contemporary perspective, this film within the film is heavy-handed and old-fashioned. My decision to present the film within the film this way was not born out of a sense of perversity or ironic detachment. Instead, I was trying to express what those images of the past would feel like to a culture that had never seen them before. What does it mean to visualize scenes of horror and heroism that, has, that history has ignored? Wouldn't they seem exaggerated? My intention in showing the extreme scenes of killings, rapes, and sexual torture was not only to make people think specifically about the Armenian genocide, but to make the viewer consider the creation of horror and how these histories are created and passed on. The enduring legacy of the Armenian genocide is not the specific nature of the crime, but the fact that a calamity of this scale can be systematically denied by its perpetrators and, until recently, the rest of the world. Ararat shows how the trauma of living with unresolved history can be transmitted from one generation to the next. The dysfunctional nature of the film within the film is a representation of the state of living with memories that have been denied. Edward Saroyan, the director of the film within the film, played by the legendary Charles Aznavour, states at various points in Ararat that the film is being made for his mother to show how she suffered. The son is telling the story of a survivor with whom he has had intimate contact. The 70-year-old director says that this is a film he always promised he would make for her. It is clearly a project that would generate huge expectations. To make a film today about the Armenian Genocide comes in the tr tr uh, tr trail of a wealth of powerful films that have depicted the Nazi atrocities of the Second World War. The character of Edward Sroin would have been at the peak of his career when NBC broadcast the television series Holocaust to over 120 million North American viewers over four consecutive evenings in April 1978. When it was screened in West Germany a year later, it attracted 14 million viewers, prompting many to view the broadcast as a turning point in German history. The European broadcast had such a profound effect that in France, the wartime slaughter of Jews ceased to be known as genocide and came to be known as the Holocaust. Of course, this post-war media attention to the Holocaust began with the trial of Adolf Eichmann in 1960. With the world press reporting the arrest and then the trial, the process was filmed in its entirety. At the end of each day, an edited selection of the clips from the day's proceedings was made available to TV networks. In this way, Eichmann and the Trials Parade of Holocaust Witnesses was brought directly into living rooms throughout the world. Most impressively, the character of Edward Sroyan would have been acutely aware of the triumph of Spielberg's Schindler's List. Awarded seven Oscars at the Academy Awards ceremony in March 1994, four years before the Titanic, Schindler's List became in short order something more than a movie. Not only did President Bill Clinton publicly urge people to watch the film, but when it premiered on NBC three years later, the Ford Motor Company, while buying advertisement rights for the movie, chose to present the event without commercials. As Tim Cole points out in his book, Selling the Holocaust, the decision to screen the movie without commercial breaks was part of a response to the criticism which had accompanied the U.S. screening of the television miniseries Holocaust almost two decades earlier, but was also a reflection of the degree of reverence accorded to Spielberg's film. Watched by over 25 million North Americans at the movie theater and 65 million when it was shown on television, Schindler's List has become, for the present generation, the most important source of historical information affecting popular perceptions of the Holocaust. How could my director of the film within the film, nearing the end of his creative career with his best days long behind him, hope to match this daunting legacy? Would he be successful? As we can see from the extended passages of Edward Saroyan's Ararat, the film within the film, his movie looks like something that was made long ago. It seems like a cinematic artifact from another time, since the idea behind the making it, while full of earnest good intention, is hardly a reflection of the state of contemporary Armenian consciousness. We've heard all those old stories before. We know the cliches about evil Turks, the scenes of torture, and the stories of what happened on the death marches. While it's important to show this material, and my film does, it is also important to address the limitations of such traditional representation. 
Well, these are images that every Armenian has been waiting to see and to have the world see. They do not reflect who we are today. These scenes, in and of themselves, cannot make up for over 93 years of denial. Indeed, Rafi's whole journey in the film must be born of his desire to shoot something authentic to what he feels. If Mount Ararat is a painted backdrop on the set, he will travel to Turkey to make a shot of the real mountain. He dreams of bringing back this image so that it could be cut into the film. He dreams of adding digital effects of people marching. He wants to remake Saroyan's old-fashioned cinematic document into images that mean something to him. All of the Armenian characters in the film are somehow involved in this process of creating meaning and significance through cultural artifact, from the unknown ancient architects of the churches of Ani and Akhtamar, to the forgotten photographer in the city of Van taking a portrait of Gorky and his mother, to Gorky painting his masterpiece years later, to Ani writing a book about the making of this masterpiece, to Ruben writing a screenplay which will include bits of Ani's book, to Ruben, um, to Edward Saroyan filming these scenes, to Rafi finally shooting his own scene, both on mysterious film and digital video diaries, as well as telling a customs officer about what he witnessed about making an Edwards movie. Through this McLuhan-esque array of hot and cool mediums, all of these characters are involved in a process of cultural transmission. In most of these cases, perceived limitations or inadequacies on the part of one teller lead to a further embellishment on the part of the next. All of these post-genocide stories are driven by a common anxiety, the anxiety of not being heard. Of course, this all leads back to my role as a filmmaker. I am ultimately responsible for the portrayal of these characters. I have chosen to depict them. These are contemporary characters whose collective history has never been made into a popular miniseries or a groundbreaking television movie or an artistically hailed film seen by millions of people all over the world. These are characters who are all somehow involved in the making of a film that doesn't even promise to be that successful. From what we see of Edwards Arad at the premiere, it seems condemned to be dismissed as a piece of pro-Armenian propaganda. But let us understand where these images come from. They arise out of fear. They come from the people who feel they have to scream in order to be heard. Edward's film could never tell a proper narrative since there's no conclusion to his story. The images in his film, though based on the eyewitness account of Clarence Usher, are concentrated expressions of what has become our legacy. There's been no chance to develop motifs or extend dramatic approaches since the essential story has remained untold. We have important works of literature by writers such as Hagop Oshagan and Vahan Totevents, but they remain unknown and largely untranslated. The best known novel about the Armenian Genocide, The Forty Days of Musa da, was written by an Austrian Jew, Franz Werfel. Published as a prescient warning call against the horrors of racial hatred in 1933, the very year the Nazis came into power in Germany, it was planned as a film to be directed by Ruben Mamoulian until MGM bent to Turkish pressure and the project was abandoned. Over and over again, Turkish sources have steadfastly protected their position, effectively demonizing the victim and rehabilitating the perpetrator. Thus it came as no surprise that the Turkish government would try and mobilize against Ararat. A massive protest was mounted against Miramax, the American distributor of the film, and its parent company, Disney. At the beginning of May 2002, a few weeks before the film's premiere in Cannes, I became aware that a script of the film had found its way into Turkey and that this blueprint had been thoroughly analyzed. Proclaiming Ararat a masterpiece propaganda film, a Dr. Sedat Lassener, who has since authored an entire book on my film, stated that I was an identity convert. Quote, he said that Adam McGoin refused his Armenian identity, did not even want to speak his mother tongue until college years, that I discovered my Armenian identity when I was 20, understood how Turks were bad. And as a well-known fact, converts are generally radicals. They tend to exaggerate the facts in order to legitimize the revolutionary shift in their way of life. Lassner went on to say that Ararat is a masterpiece propaganda film financed by the Armenian lobby groups and supported by the Armenian Ministry of Culture. 
It is a well-packed film with cinematic tricks, but it is impossible not to see the director's hatred behind the cinema curtain. Now, it must be fully revealed that Ararat was fully financed by the Canadian company Alliance Atlantis through an output deal with Serendipity Point Films. Serendipity Point Films is the boutique production company of my longtime producer, Robert Lantosh. Robert Lantosh produced the film. If he's Armenian, he hasn't told me. As far as I've been able to determine, Robert Lantosh is a Hungarian Jew who immigrated to Canada without the vaguest idea that he would one day be mistaken for the Armenian Ministry of Culture. In addition, the reaction from the U.S. distributor, Miramax, was clear. On his way to the premiere of the film in Cannes, Harvey Weinstein was stopped by a reporter from the Los Angeles Times and asked about the increasingly hysterical response. He replied, they're trying to lobby in Washington. They're saying the whole movie is a PR thing, that it never happened. They're denying history. To me, the denial of the Ar Armenian Holocaust reminded me of the denial of our own Jewish Holocaust, and I feel strongly about that. In the weeks leading up to the film's premiere, I tried to maintain the position that the film wasn't political. In retrospect, I'm not entirely sure what I meant by this idea. I think I believed in what must now be perceived as a resolutely naive gesture, that I could somehow keep myself outside of the controversy. I felt that my status as an artist would grant me the privilege of allowing me to sit back and just watch it all unfold. The historical issues by the film would be taken up by the historians, while the political issues would be taken up by the politicians. This was not to be the case. Writing in the Globe and Mail, the Canadian national paper, Ray Conalogue wrote an article entitled, Bracing for Cinema's Judgment. In this article, Conalogue begins by stating that my wish not to have the film politicized was a little like a property developer piously hoping that nobody would perceive his 100-story skyscraper as a large building. After quoting Britannica online to the effect that scholars agree that the propaganda from both sides has greatly confounded the issue, and with the caveat that he was personally agnostic about the issue, Conalog states that he was sympathetic to the Turks' inability to get their point of view before the public. In a breathtakingly irresponsible act of journalism, Conalog then presents a number of letters he accumulated from various ordinary Turks expressing their dismay at my film project. The most pathetic decision was the choice to include the comment of a 17-year-old girl who wrote, and I quote, Mr. Goyne, I, ask, I want to ask you if this event had happened in your history, and if you were accused of such a thing, what would you do? Please be honest and think about this. Well, let me be honest and think about this. How can a professional journalist allow himself to quote such an in, in, incoherent and dangerous statement? I'm certainly not accusing this young woman of being complicit in the Armenian genocide of 1915. It is the sad reality of her upbringing that she doesn't have the privilege of having access to her own history. Her government has denied her the ability to have access to the facts. But if I were accused of such a thing, I would do everything in my power to understand whether the accusations were true. Unfortunately, this young woman is living in a country where she will have a great difficulty in achieving this, since her government not only denies this historic reality, but has also outlawed the very use of the word genocide as a way of designating the historic event. After a flood of letters from indignant Armenians, including myself, Conalog clarified his agnosticism by stating that he had no intention of denying the slaughter of Armenians, but was only agnostic in the sense that historians are still arguing whether this is genocide in the legal sense of the word. It is easy to see how this discourse, begun before anyone had even seen the film, set the tone for what was to follow. From the moment the film premiered at Cannes, there was one school of thought that asserted that the film should have been a cinematic monument to what had happened. Any film that presented the Armenian Genocide had a responsibility to set the record straight in black and white terms, to be, in short, what Edward Soyan was trying to create in the film within the film. According to one reviewer, the fact that I didn't dwell on this historical representation was either an exercise in pretension or timidity that exploits the tragedy. Curiously, this response has come entirely from non-Armenians, who, in the words of Jonathan Foreman of the New York Post, <clears throat> have stated that the event deserves a more engaged and honest treatment. Many of these critics felt exasperated by the devices that I chose to, um, to seem to complicate unnecessarily the presentation of history. This was a story that needed to be told, so why not tell it in a straightforward way? The Washington Post printed two reviews of the film in its release. 
While one critic complained that I was trying way too much and had worked too hard on this movie, another, in the very same edition, observed that I seem to agree with Henry James that historical fiction is neither. The critic concluded that Ararat was successful in leading a viewer through a thorny and complicated story, addressing moral ambiguity without succumbing to it. <clears throat> As you can see, unlike many of my colleagues, I do read my reviews. What has surprised me is the ease with which the ideas in the film, ideas which I consider to be timely and hugely pertinent to the world we're living in now, could have been dismissed by the simple claim that the film was trying to do too much. Any plot summary of Ararat, which, one criti which any critic is bound to supply, becomes quickly bogged down by the film's various subplots and secondary characters. For my part, with some degree of distance, I still find it impossible to imagine how any of the characters or circumstances could be further tailored. Again, my work might have taken a different shape if a more popular movie version of the Armenian Genocide had already existed, but this was not the case. My film had to tell the story of what happened, why it happened, why it's denied, how it's denied, and what happens when you continue to deny. As I said, Ararat is a story about the transmission of trauma. It's cross-cultural and intergenerational. The grammar of the film uses every possible tense and mood available to tell its story, from the basic pillars of the past, present, and future, to the subjective, the past perfect, the past not so perfect, and the past would be perfect if it wasn't so conditional. I firmly believe that this was the only way the story could be told. It's dense and complex because the issues are so dense and complex. A few weeks before the film's premiere the, as the opening night gala of the Toronto International Film Festival, I received an email from a Turkish student who was studying film theory and political science at an American university. I'd like to take the opportunity to read some extracts from this letter, since they're so pertinent to this discussion. He wrote to me, Dear Sir, I would like to address a certain thing that has been making me spend restless nights in the past few days, in fact, weeks. I wish this letter could go directly to Mr. Egoyan himself. I've been a follower of Mr. Egoyan's work since Exotica, and I'm a great lover of the movie The Sweet Hereafter. This is neither a threat letter, nor a plea for you to abandon the movie, nor a propaganda letter defending the government, uh, Turkish government's statements. All I want to know is your stand, your take on the whole situation. We both know the controversy surrounding all the things that happened in the Ottoman Empire rule. I have tried to investigate the truth behind this, yet one sees nothing but propaganda on both sides. It seems to me the only way to actually approach this is in, an, is in an emotional way, taking the full poetic license and making the audience realize this. I am against movies like Pearl Harbor, Schindler's List, or Saving Private Ryan. They give the illusions of being real, of being documentaries, even tricking the audience, creating the illusion of having been there. I think such behavior is disrespectful of the people who actually went through such experiences. I believe cinema has the power to stir and sh make us share emotions, and I believe that this becomes a ruthless mind wash when combined with things such as the documentary style of Saving Private Ryan. And this student continues by saying, now let me take you, uh, give you my take on the situation. As you know, there's hatred on both sides, but how does a filmmaker stand in this chaos? The media is in our hands. We have crafted many of today's famed symbols and metaphors. We have such power in our hands. How do we use it? Ararat and all the events along with it are horrifying. 1.5 million dead, 1,500, or only one. It is a travesty in each option, and I am sick and tired defending the twisted ideals of a monarchy that my nation got rid of for the sake of freedom anyway. So how would I, what would I make of the movie? I don't know. I don't know in what mindset I would be if similar things happened to my people. I wouldn't have the right to make such a movie. I'm merely voicing my concerns, my inner devils. I thank you for taking your time in reading this letter and being exposed to some idealistic kid. I never responded to this email. I was overwhelmed by its confusion, for I immediately recognized the source of these mixed emotions. What this idealistic kid was talking about was the disparity between the horror of man's inhumanity to man and the uneasy alchemy that occurs when one combines elements of cinema, glamour, and atrocity. Any act of tyranny or terror involves a dehumanizing of the other. Can a scene that depicts an act of terror ever truly serve to counter this effect? If an act of genocide is only made possible by the abstraction of other human beings, can a film about genocide serve to rectify this violence? 
Referring back to the pivotal scene where Rafi drives Ali home, he thanks the actor who played the monster Jebjit Bey for incarnating the evil that destroyed his race. Ali responds by dismissing the young man's compliment, saying that he was prepared to hate his character, that he was preconditioned by his community, and any response was the result of this preconditioning. In other words, his response was to be expected and its value thus diminished. Rafi's reaction to this expresses the same sense of anguish that was contained in the email I received from this idealistic kid. He says that he is suspicious of anything that is designed to provoke a reaction, of anything that's supposed to make him feel something. But what Ali did with his performance somehow transcended these concerns. His dramatization was so compelling that it made Rafi feel all that anger again. Is this a good thing? What can it lead to? Is it a progressive energy? Does it help solve anything? Years ago, I felt that the issues raised in this film would address the idealistic kids' questions. Yet there's something naive about this attitude, about the belief that a film could ever tell the true story. Isn't this exactly Rafi's dilemma as he watches Edward's film shoot? What is it about this cinematic artifact that makes Rafi need to go to Turkey with the improbable goal of shooting the real Mount Ararat? What is it that drives the young man's need for authenticity? In the course of making the first commercially distributed film dealing with the Armenian Genocide, I was faced with an odd variant of the old philosophical quandary. If a tree falls in an empty forest where no one can hear it, does it still make a sound? The genocide of a people had occurred 93 years ago, but to much of the world, this event had become surrounded by an empty forest of denial. Did this atrocity still make a sound? Did it need a film to make it happen? In the sense of registering this event with the rest of the world, did it have to be made into a movie? In our media-hungry culture, would the books and the archives and the survivor's stories ever be enough? I realize that there are some who have been angered by my insistence on asking these questions in the face of something so massively cataclysmic as the genocide of a people, especially when, in this case, it is my own people. But I must stress that I am concerned not only with the aesthetics focusing on the unreliability of language and representation. Rather, I am convinced that it is only through these questions that the emotional nature of the subject could be addressed. I wasn't simply interested in making a film that probes our need for making and watching films. This type of postmodernist exercise within which my work has often been located is becoming tiresome and so hermetically sealed within its own world of semiotics and theory that it misses the reason why most people go and see movies. People go and see films because they expect to be moved. When they go and see a film about genocide and its residual effects on generations and survivors and their children, they expect to be really moved. Which brings us back to the Titanic story. What I had found so suspicious about the commemorative silence imposed on the international audience that night was the unholy marriage of real human suffering with real human arrogance. By winning the Oscar for Best Picture that night, James Cameron had forever cemented his identity as a filmmaker with the history of Titanic. He would be responsible for the way a new generation would now remember the event. And yet, I believe that there's something about the sheer scale of this type of blockbuster filmmaking that somehow resists the way in which history is most effectively passed. In making Ararat, I wanted to show how the truth is not to be found in the epic scenes of deportation and massacre, but in the intimate moments shared by individuals, between strangers in a hallway, between workers on a film set, and most profoundly in the conversations between parents and their children. Any blockbuster attempt to amplify the event from the very private turmoil its memory provokes is to diminish or at least misrepresent an essential aspect of its meaning. At the end of the film, in a dark room at a customs office, a truth is finally revealed. Rafi appeals to David, the customs officer, to accept his testimony in an act of faith beyond any proof. After the collapse of his story, he is left only with his words. This moment that is shared between the customs officer and the young man he has been interrogating has come from a deep sense of compassion, and I firmly believe that it is only from this capacity, the ability to feel someone else's experience of the world, 
that we can draw any hope for reconciliation. Everything else leads to torture, murder, and yes, even genocide. Compassion leads to the revelation and disclosure of truth in all its interconnectedness and devastating elaboration. And compassion certainly cannot exist if one's energies are used to conceal. In making a film that dealt with this history, I was dealing with the legacy of concealment and denial. As a result, I needed to tell this story with a forest of questions and the sound of many possible answers. I needed to present Ararat with pristine complexity, showing how history is often created from the effort to accommodate differing accounts of the same event. From the stories of survivors passed on to children and grandchildren, to the industrial needs of commercial entertainment, to the private and sacred mythologies of art, the collective human linkage of experience is both the wonder and tragedy of our condition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I suppose we have a. reached a possibility of real dialogue between you and uh, our guest, Atom Egoyan, questions and answer. You are entitled to ask uh, any question relating to Mr. Egoyan work in cinema or whatever you want to ask. Um, you remember there are two microphones here, you can use them or rather shout so that we can hear you. Is there any question? Please. Um, excuse my English, please. <laughs> and I want to ask Mr. Aguian, uh, I fully understand your need as a person, your wish, and the, the, the inner demand to make a political movie uh, to establish the narrative that in cinema about your people that nobody has uh, done before. But as an artist, I want uh, to ask you this question. I've seen uh, your movies uh, Ex Exotica and then uh, The Sweetness Hereafter, which in my eyes was, or for me, was one of the most painful movies i ever seen, and yet uh, awesome power to raise this, uh, this pain in me. Uh, but political movies, not only yours, I must admit, uh, do not do it for me. And I ask you, uh, if you yourself can feel or see this difference between a political movie about any subject and the movies that you are doing about people as human beings and uh, without any political uh, context. Oh. Okay, this is uh, my question. Thank you. Uh, I, th I think it's a really good question and it's uh, actually, uh, I, I, I do think that uh, any film that comes with any sort of agenda uh, in some ways reduces the ability to absorb uh, complexity because you are aware of that. Uh, and I, on the other hand, felt that I had to address this issue at some point in my career. Uh, I might have wanted to wait until later in my career, but uh, the opportunity came up uh, at this particular moment because uh, of the encouragement of, of Robert Lantos, who, who I uh, mentioned. And it was I realized I could keep delaying this, but I had to 
I had to deal with the subject. Um, I, my dream is that the film, as, as I think I mentioned, you know, could have relied on those relationships within the film, but it's impossible to paint it without some introduction into what the history is. And that's the more didactic aspect of the movie. I mean, and it's unavoidable. Um, as I said in the lecture, if, if a film had already existed or if this event existed in people's minds, I would have taken a different strategy, but that wasn't really available. Uh, and it's, maybe what you're also suggesting is that literature uh, is more adept at being able to deal with that than filmmaking. This is one of the ideas that I might be presenting in this, that the, veer, the, the sheer nature of how films are produced uh, means that history has to be magnified in a way that is out of scale to what the human suffering or pain is about. It's just inevitable. Yes, please. Hello. Um, it's a great honor, and uh, I don't really have a question. I wanted to thank you. As a, an Israeli film student, and I see myself as a political person, and I think um, what you did here, instead of coming as a, a world uh, infamous, uh, not infamous, famous, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little, <laughs> I'm, I'm very are. nervous. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to thank you for making such, a, such an important political statement today and in your film and to, to thank you for inspiring me and I hope uh, many other students to, to think about uh, our history and to learn more about um, uh, important uh, influential events like this and thank you for coming thank you. here. That means a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Nika Padubska, I'm from Ukraine. And my question is, how you understand one morning or one day or maybe one evening what your profession, this is a director? How I understand? How you understand? You see uh, something special maybe Maybe many people don't understand you. You're uh, looking for this world, or maybe. Well, yeah. I mean, I think I think I'm very interested in the the mystery of any meeting between two people. I think that there's an, a tremendous uh, amount of mystery in, in in that contact between human beings, and that very often films uh, make that seem very casual and very normal and and very easy. But there's very often a tremendous amount of negotiation involved, and that fascinates me. Uh, and I think that that's the basis of a lot of the drama. It's trying to understand that essential mystery of how people connect. Okay, and I want to ask a second uh, question. How you think, think uh, if director uh, work one alone or good group how how special uh, film he take in finish well i work i, I i've been working so, with a group of people for 20 years so in a way we become i was funny i was talking about this with uh, the film students uh, earlier uh, is that uh, it's it's a collaborative process absolutely but if you are working with people that you trust and uh, whose sensibility you understand, it becomes very personal, even though there's a group of people. It's really, uh, and I'm very fortunate that way. I think it's just the result of this family of collaborators that I have uh, who we just, we work in a very intimate scale, even though uh, we're very different personalities. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. please. I would like to go back to the question of history vis-a-vis uh, -vis poetry and poetic license. It seems to me that um, speaking about Ararat, you're affirming the story. You're saying, well, we know the story. I want to do something else. 
But I wonder, uh, comparing Ararat to your previous uh, movies, uh, most of your cinemas actually undermine our capacity to tell a story. And uh, the way I saw Ararat is basically that, that you, you, your claim is a historical claim, that there is no clear distinction between events and the way we represent them. It's not just about representation, but it's about this very tricky um, intersection between truth and meaning. So uh, could you say more about yeah, your... I mean, you know, I, it's funny because in some ways uh, I was the last filmmaker, you know, imaginable to make this film because uh, of these issues that are raised in my cinema generally, especially, as I said, in, in, in an event that is so um, precarious uh, to approach it from this point of view is very dangerous. Uh, and, and one of the things that I resisted, but I, I'm, I'm finally very happy, uh, Amir Max, when Harvey Weinstein saw the film, which he really liked, he said, we need to put a card at the end which says that this actually happened. And, and uh, I resisted it. I said, uh, no, no, I mean, that, that totally, you know, it breaks the spirit of the film, but he insisted. Uh, and as you probably know, when he insists, it's pretty difficult to say no. Uh, and I'm really glad he did, because I think that it's, it, it's important that, uh, that you do situate, are able to situate the film in a reality, even though I'm taking a huge risk, I think, by, by using a reality which is in such a uh, ephemeral place in, in the collective consciousness. But I actually find that one of the unique aspects of the Armenian Genocide, it's actually dramatically very interesting that something, as I said, of that scale can exist in such a peripheral way and that that provides a, a very, very disturbing but compelling backdrop for these characters as well. I'm not entirely sure if I was the best filmmaker to make the first movie about this that gets distribution, but that's just the way it happened. And I think that uh, what's been fascinating is that, uh, you know, my, my wife was in a film last year made by the Taviani brothers called The Lark Farm, which was presented in Berlin, and it's based on a very well-known uh, Italian novel about the Armenian Genocide. And it's a very good, clear, historic representation uh, made by, you know, very famous directors, the Tavianis, but it, it doesn't really, has not found a place because in a way it is a, a vision of history that we have seen and that I think that as problematic as this film might be in some ways, its very character has focused a degree of discussion and it's is a film unlike any other movie that has been made. I can say that without you know, being pretentious. I mean, I know that it's, it's unusual. Uh, I think literature has dealt with this issue, uh, but not filmmaking. It's just it's unusual to have this type of access to this type of filmmaking at this level and be as uh, experimental, if you will, in, in the approach. Any more? Yes, please that uh, you show the conflict, let's say, from many, many angles, and in the end you just let each viewer take his own stand, or you feel as a responsibility as a director to, to make a stand, whatever it is, maybe your opinion, or maybe the opinion you think that will uh, uh, serve the, the movie that you make the best way. And, uh, well, the stand is... You know, I mean, uh, Harvey was correct. That is the stand. The card at the end is the stand. I mean, which is that this did happen and that it, it, it continues to be denied. That is the reality. Uh, um, and politically, uh, I feel that one has to expose that lie as much as possible. However, dramatically, uh, I'm dealing with characters who are in the midst of that moral crisis, you know, of living with uh, this event. So um, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not political. I do have a political, uh, you know, position. But the agenda of this film is not necessarily to affirm once and for all through the movie that this happened. 
You know, it's, 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 it's actually dealing with another subject. It's actually dealing with the psychological uh, effects of, of denial on several generations from the event. So it's, it's loaded, you know. It, it's, it's interesting. And it's an interesting, I think, it, you know, it, it's, it's actually dealing with four generations. It's dealing with the generation of the, of, of, of the, of the victim, played by Arshil Gorky, of the survivor, played by Ed, Edward Saroyan, the director, of, the, of a grandchild, uh, of, or a child of a, grandchild of a survivor, played by uh, the art historian, and then they have a great-grandchild. So it's like you, you have four def different generations which are interacting with each other. And that's, that's the project of the film, is to show uh, the tr this transmission of trauma. It's very, yeah, loaded. And, and, and I can't say that it's a completely, you know, um, I, I, I understand what the, what the woman brought up before, uh, up to and including Sweet Hereafter, there was this, uh, complete detachment from politics. And I must confess that the film that changed my mind in some ways was Felicia's Journey, which I shot after Sweet Hereafter. And uh, in that film, there's a very strong subtext of uh, Ireland and England. And there's a, if, you, if you've seen the film, there's a, a moment where the father is taking uh, the character of Felicia on a walk in this destroyed castle in Ireland, destroyed by Cromwell, I suppose. And you know, he's talking about the English monster, and he's talking about the heritage that this, his daughter comes from, and how she can't forget what happened in 1917, which is uh, the year of the Easter Rebellion. And I was thinking, how strange it is. I'm making a movie where I'm talking about 1917, and I'm using that in the dialogue, and I'm having a character trying to make another character remember 1917, and I've never dealt with 1915, which is two years before. And that m maybe created a, a, a shift. In, in some ways, that was the first film that began to use politics explicitly was Felicia's Journey, though in that case, the politics are very well known. And it become, you know, that's the, what I'm talking about. The Irish, you know, conflict with, with, with England has been used so much, and we have such a wealth of literature, you know, um, you know and movies and music, you know, uh, that deals with this. That it's, a, it's not a, it's just, it's a, an archetype. You know, and we're able to use that as something that we can almost acknowledge and then move on. In that case, it happens to be, in terms of popular culture, English speaking. You know, it's, you know the, the whole uh, IRA conflict was basically played out in the English language so that dramatists could present it and it would find a world audience very easily, uh, which is not the case, certainly, um, you know, in, in my story. Thank you. In some of your movies, I perceive something special in the way you direct actors. Do you have any special technique for that? Um, uh, well, uh, the, my, the, my film students will, will, will laugh after what I told them this morning, which I won't repeat, uh, about working with actors. But I think that um, the, the issue is, when I talked before about the mystery of connection between people, that there are so many things that a person has to decide whether or not to reveal uh, or to retain when dealing in any conversation. There's an infinite number of decisions and choices made on, on the trust that a person feels towards someone else. And I think that the more an actor understands that process, I guess what you would call subtext, you know? I mean. Uh, it's almost a cliche to talk about subtext, but I find subtext fascinating, you know, and the stuff that's not being said. And being able to make sure that an actor understands all the possible things that could be said in response to a question or a certain way a dialogue goes. But they make a decision to use these words or to pursue this path. And the more that they could be thinking of all the other possible things that they could be doing or saying, the more interesting that close-up will be, the more interesting that performance will be. Thank you very much. Mm.
Yeah. Well, I think I think uh, any film is 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 the alchemy of these various parts, you know. And and there are some things you can design and conceive of, and other things that you react to as you're shooting. Um, the one thing about Sweet Hereafter is that the structure changed a lot in the editing, you know, like the actual shape of it changed a lot as we were uh, putting it together. And the other thing that was very uh, risky, because it's not in the book, is the whole use of the Pied Piper as a as a motif. You know, the Rob, the, the 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 Robert Browning poem, um, and I guess what I was trying to achieve in in that film was uh, very specific. And the only person who put it into two words was Tim Burton, who was on the jury in Cannes. And I remember he came up to me and he said, "The film has a, a creepy lyricism." And I thought, that, yeah, that's exactly it. It's like a, it, there's something lyrical, but it's also creepy. And, it, you know, and, and the creepiness, of course, is because of what we're seeing. But also, when we're talking about denial, I think what makes that film unique is that, and it's disturbing to put it this way, but it's one of the few films that shows uh, sexual abuse of a child from the point of view of the child as they are imagining what the parent must be doing as opposed to from the point of view of a victim after they acknowledge the crime. So Sarah's character in that film is still trying to understand why the father, and maybe he's become almost strangely dependent on the father's particular type of attention. And I was trying to situate it in this very, very, very dangerous zone so that she's created a whole world which explains to herself why the father is acting this way. And she, in the book, if you read the book, it's very different. The character is very angry and, 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 and almost uh, enraged by the father. But I thought it would be very interesting to place it in this other place because it's a reality that, that abuse, from a victim's point of view, uh, until it's actually acknowledged, exists in this strange world where they, a child has to ex come up with some explanation. And I wanted to create this, 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 this mood. Uh, and it permeates the film in a really profound way. Uh, and it, you know, it's coming from a, a very particular place. And I, I think it's, it's unusual. There are people who watch the film and don't even understand that that's what it's about. You know, that's what's really weird for me. There are people who think that it's really about the town's grief uh, over losing its children, but it's really about this young girl's grief over, you know, the father's uh, abuse, really. That's what the film is about. And maybe in that way it's a continuation of Exotica. You know, Exotica ended with, you know, seeing this girl going towards this house and not knowing what's inside, but seeing all the consequences of that shown in the film beforehand, and, 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 and Sweeter After is an attempt to go into that house. So, but you know, the music was planned beforehand. I mean, I had this idea of using medieval music and, and uh, to create a sense of timelessness. Um, but the structure changed a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Because originally it started off in the script that she had the accident at the beginning, and the whole film was a voiceover talking to the lawyer. So the, these long shots where you see the camera moving onto Sarah's face, they had voiceover before. And I would never have shot it this way if I didn't think there was voiceover. But the beautiful thing is that then we realized the voiceover was stupid, like it just it, it ruined the movie. But you still had these shots which, which created a sense of an internal dialogue which made the film very unusual. Uh, and, uh, and then the music over the, these scenes and, and I think her performance, which is really quite exceptional. She's coming next week here to Haifa, actually. So. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about Ararat, uh, which I found when I saw it first uh, fascinating movie. And because of the things you were talking about, 
The question I wanted to ask <coughs> is about uh, uh, some of the subplots of the movie. Uh, why did you why did you feel that you need to expand the the subplots like uh, the backstory of the customs officer and uh, <coughs> his relationship uh, with his son and uh, Rafi's mother, uh, uh, all these uh, subplots which are not directly connected to... Yeah, they're not directly connected, but they are in some ways, because the interesting thing about the film is that Rafi undergoes a transformation because he gets to tell his story to somebody and make that person believe them, believe him. But what he'll never know is why the customs officer chose that night to focus on Rafi, like what the, project, what the officer was projecting onto Rafi. We know that as, 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 a, as a viewer that it's his last night, that he has this incredible strife with his son, and it's all about tolerance. I think Christopher Plummer's character really is trying his best to accommodate a situation with his son, but the son is just not accepting it. And that idea of tolerance really weaves its way into the film in a, in a really powerful way. What's more problematic looking at the film now is the, is, is the mother and the stepdaughter, which was really icing on the cake. I mean, it's a Canadian film, and I thought that you know this whole idea of her being Quebecoise and her having a history with her father, and that, that Annie, who is a professor dealing with history and denial, the fact that that she could actually deny this young woman her history is a very interesting aspect to me. I think everyone believes that if you are the victim of trauma that you will then learn from it and you will never ever traumatize someone else. And of course the reality is if you've been raised with denial or you've been raised with a genocide, there's a tendency which has actually taught you how to become uh, a denialist. You know, and that's that's a that's a hard reality. You know, and it's, it's like it, it's like saying again, talking about abuse. You would like to think that an abused child would learn uh, what the danger of abuse is, but very often they perpetuate the abuse. And so it's just I wanted to bring that into the conversation as well. And that's why I'm saying the film is probably way too ambitious. It's just it should have been written as a novel first, and then I should have done an adaptation of the novel. <laughs> But that just wasn't the case. You know, I, I, sometimes I think about that, that I, I just, I wish, I mean, in a way it's structured like a, a, a novel. And unfortunately, the, the adaptation uh, was not really done carefully enough to extract some of those subplots, which you would do in any adaptation of a, of a book. But that's just the nature of it. You know, it, it, it was written in a kind of a, a, a blind flash. And all these ideas were so exciting to me. And I think that what happens is that you have to believe that everyone's going to get it all. You know, you have this imaginary audience and everyone is going to understand everything that you're doing, you know. And, and it's, it's, some people actually do, and that's incredible. But for the most part, it's like, why do we have to spend time with this character now? And why do we have, you know, but it's, it's just the nature of uh, the, the beast, you know. The beast is very uh, unusual, the, the, this, type of, this type of project. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately about this form, feature films. And I was thinking if I was, sometimes I think if I was a film student now, I, I'd be very fascinated by long-form television. Because, you know, we used to think that the feature film was the novel, but in fact it's the long-form television series, which, which has these characters which just keep, you know, these cross-cutting and going from one story to the other. It's actually, in some ways, it's very, very... Uh, accessible to us in television in a way that maybe in feature films it's not. Hmm? Yeah. Yes, any more questions? Please. Well, yeah, I mean, again, you know, that was, uh, again, Harvey's idea that we put that subtitle 
that it says Arshil Gorky in the studio in New York? Because, of course, I assume everyone knows about Arshil Gorky, uh, you know, because uh, to me he's a very famous artist, but he's probably in the grand scheme of things, you know, he's not uh, Willem de Kooning or he's not, you know, uh, Jackson Pollock, but he is, for people in the art world, a very major figure. But people don't know he's Armenian uh, because he changed his name. He, he created a whole other identity for himself. He's a fascinating character. His original name was Vostan Nigaduyan, and he changed his name to Arshil Gorky. And he said to the New York press that he was the cousin of Maxim Gorky. <laughs> and this was a story that he can, you know, had all his life. And it's unbelievable, really. It's unthinkable. He became like a Zelig sort of character, and he created this whole persona of him as a, a you know, Russian kind of uh, crazed kind of artist. And, uh, and, and meanwhile, he had this incredible anguish that he was carrying. And, uh, and then there's another interesting story related to him because his cousin, Carlin, you know, revealed all these letters where Gorky goes on about, you know, the nature of Armenian art and, you know, and the transmission of this to Carlin. And, and then Carlin, as it turns out, uh, created all these letters. You know, like they, they were frauds. They were not real, you know. So, you know, talk about transmission of trauma. You know, it's really quite an amazing story. But, uh, uh, I, I understand that some people just don't know. I mean, I said that in the, uh, you know, people don't know that he's, he is the famous survivor of the Armenian Genocide. Hi. Hi. You mentioned before uh, Spielberg's Schindler's List, and I wanted to ask you about another uh, film, another Oscar winning, uh, Roberto Benigni's Life is Beautiful. This film has made many, is very con controversial, and he had largely con criticized, I think, mostly in Israel. I, th I thought instead that uh, it's a film which is a legend, it's not pretending to tell the story. It's not pretending to be the history, as you told, like being a lesson history and uh, that people will get their knowledge about the Holocaust from it. And I wanted to ask you, what is your opinion in, about this genre of, um, of film, which is treating such a really heavy uh, and complicated theme in a um, light, legendary way? What but but I think it? that that's, you know, strangely enough, that's the the huge advantage that an artist has in dealing with Holocaust because there have been so many interpretations that, you know, it exists in people's consciousness. You can make the producers. I mean, Mel Brooks, you know, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do anything really because it, it exists. And, and even something like the Benini's film, which I think is a misfire completely, but nevertheless, it can exist and it doesn't necessarily threaten the sanctity of the event itself. I mean, that is that is so documented and, 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 you know, there have been great Holocaust movies, there have been terrible Holocaust movies. And then what sometimes the thing that amazes me are the really interesting films that are completely unseen. Like, uh, did you see The Gray Zone? Which I thought was a very, you know, you know, but no one watched it, you know? Like, it was completely, no, so, so you can even make a really great small film about the Holocaust and no one even bothers with it, you know, because there's such an abundance of movies. Uh, so, as much as I object to that particular film, maybe it's it, you can't get that upset about it because ultimately it's not going to change people's image of what of what happened. However, uh, I do think that that there is a uh, you know you know the, the thing that becomes continually fascinating about 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 the Holocaust is the central issue of how could such a civilized culture at that point, you know, be able to indoctrinate its citizens with this absolutely uh, uh, horrifying plan. And, you know, I also must say that one of the things that, uh, uh, and this, I, I don't mean to be, I mean, uh, when people talk about the, because very often with the Armenian issue, people talk about the, uh, the uniqueness of the Holocaust. And I th think very often people maybe don't understand what is so unique about the Holocaust. The, what's unique about the Holocaust is the, is the role of anti-Semitism and that it's a universal concept. And what's unique about the Holocaust is ultimately that if the Nazis had succeeded in their plan for world domination, this would have happened and been executed in every country because the seeds of it were there. And no country, I think, including the U.S., if I can say, would have been actually immune from this if in that horrifying nightmare that would have happened. And that's what makes the Holocaust unique is anti-Semitism. 
you know, the Armenian genocide is based on, you know, anti-Armenian feeling in the eastern provinces of Turkey at that time. It's very localized. There was never a universal concept that, the, you know, that this, this, that, 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 that this image existed uh, that demonized Armenians universally. And that's, I think, you know, both the thing that characterizes the Holocaust, but also means that many different cultures have also approached it artistically, both in using reality and using imagination as a, as a point of departure. I want to add one, one thing. Don't you think it's problematic that uh, spectators expect a movie, a movie, a filmmaker to give them um, a lesson in history? Is this expected from a filmmaker? I mean, isn't yeah, it problematic well, that the, that's what, the, I mean, go and study history and then see films and then do... I, I think it is expected, and I think that I am, I, I, I do think I've been gratified by the people who have watched the film and said, I didn't know about this. I mean, so that, you know, it does provide some glimpse into this history, but it is not unlike, let's say, the Taviani Brothers film or, um, you know, like there's some extraordinary books. And if, if any of you are interested in this, I really encourage you to read. There's some amazing uh, books that have been published in Hebrew by a very good scholar called Yair Oron. Uh, which deals with specifically Israel and the Armenian genocide. Uh, one book is called The Banality of Denial. The other one is called The Banality of Indifference. So if you are interested in the history, I would, you know, research those two ec excellent books. Uh, uh, plus, as I said, the work of Israel Charney and uh, Yehuda Bauer um, at the Hebrew University. But um, there is stuff that you can draw from this film, but it is not going to give you the detail that, that these books can. I mean, it's just not the nature of the beast. It's not the nature of, the, of this project. And, and it's, uh, it's not a documentary. There have been also extraordinary documentaries made, but it's not my tradition. It's not what I'm coming from. Thank you. Okay, we are nearing the time limit of our session. We have time for one or two questions, please. Um, well, the, the any projects I'm working on today, I mean, it's pretty, I, in two days I'm premiering my new film at the Cannes Film Festival, so I'm leaving here tomorrow to go right into that premiere on Thursday night, so that's my next project. It's a film called Adoration, and it'll be showing uh, at 10.30 uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in Cannes, so that's a bit surreal. Um, and the, uh, would I have made this film any differently? Uh, Boy, I, 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 I don't think so. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, it's pretty, I, just being specific, I probably, I originally wanted to cast uh, to be, I wanted Sarah to play the stepdaughter, and, uh, and I changed that because I thought the whole Quebecois issue was going to be really interesting. And I realized that it wasn't even that interesting to, to people in Quebec. You know, so it's, it's maybe that political history uh, mapping that terrain was a little cumbersome because most people don't understand why she's speaking French and they don't really understand that Canada is bilingual or they don't, you know, that's, it's not really pertinent. And uh, that's, that's the only thing I would tailor, maybe. Yes, please. No? Yes? No questions? Yes, yes one please. more. That's a really good question. Uh, yes, that is one of the, the, the question was about whether or not I had uh, Alain René's uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour in mind. That, that was a very important movie for me. Uh, and I think you're absolutely, that, that is actually one of the other films that deals with this. So in a very different approach, but you know, of course they are shooting a film uh, in the context of this incredible story. Uh, not consciously, but very often we don't have things consciously in mind, but that film was huge. and. Uh, um, I think it's probably one of the few other movies, right, that actually deals with that intersection. And, and, uh, and of course, you know, just his, his, his short, uh, uh, Night in Fog, is also incredibly powerful as well as, as, a, as a depiction of, of atrocity. But, but not, not explicitly, no. He's an amazing filmmaker, Alain René. I think that uh, he's one of my favorite filmmakers. I think what he's doing structurally is just so extraordinary in films like Muriel as well which is from that same period. 
Yes. Everything good has to end, and we, I think I, we came to the end. I would like to thank Atome Goyan first for his beautiful, complex, and so moving films. Then I would like to thank him for the insights he gave us today, both on the lecture, in the lecture and in, in his answers to your question. I would like to wish him all the success in the world in the Cannes Film Festival. But, but... But I have mixed feelings about this because he competes against our waltz with Bashir yes. of Ari Fulman. So a little mixed feelings. <laughs> Anyhow, best success in Cannes, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.